this freaky finance here. A couple weeks ago we looked at Wendy's. And this week I really want to get Jack in the box out. I wanted to have a decent investor day presentation. And I want to get it out, out after Lamb Weston. Because we did see weakness in QSRs. I think this ties into a whole lot of good information. and stuff I didn't know either. So I hope you guys like this video. There's a lot of slides here. So I'm going to try to go relatively quick to try to keep it condensed. And yeah, it's just a... Uh, I think it's a good follow-up to what we saw with Wendy's. So I always love Investor Days because they give quite a lot of information and it helps you understand the business better. Jack in the Box is interesting. So unlike other QSRs, so quick service restaurants, it, it's really split into two. So they've acquired Del Taco. And then you have the core business Jack in the Box. And you'll see Jack in the Box here. It's 93% franchised. And we talk about franchise now enough times. It's the third video. On franchises and Del Taco last franchise is 71% and trying to be 90% by 2026. Now the idea we, we kind of talked about the franchise model a few times but the idea is you push the operational burden on the franchisee and you're the franchisor you kind of get that the royalty kickback um, and the franchise we know through McDonald's and stuff like that that the franchise -er model is actually pretty strong especially in inflationary environments and now we're on the other end of that and we've seen a share, and you'll see this when we go through some of the call notes, we've seen the share shift. Um, people, especially lower income consumers, are basically not showing up in the QSRs right now. They're basically tapped out and they're going just to grocery stores because it's cheaper. Um, so we've seen that trade down continue. And right now the QSRs, as we speak, are promoting it out. So what that means is that they're promoting more to drive more traffic, but this, that depresses margins. And they're all trying to do it at the same time. So it's kind of like a fight right now, like a fast food fight. <laughs> so I think that timing of the video is pretty fun. I did pick up this one. We've seen a lot of pressure in the QSRs. Again, um, we actually, I think when I did at and if I did a video on that one, it was the same idea. It's basically of a price war. And investors hate price wars. They always want, uh, investors always want uh, price control. So... I do own Jack in the Box. I picked some up. I'm not sure if I'll hold it for a long time or not, but I just thought it was an interesting stock and I want to do a video on it. And we won't go to any of the other ones, but it is crazy how much AST Space Mobile shot up after that video we did a while back. But anyway, I'm actually putting up the numbers too. Um, and if you hear anything in the background, that is my dogs fighting it out upstairs. So, <laughs> um, anyway. Here is the revenues by segment, and this is what I like to break down just to see which one's um, more important to the business. So this is on the quarterly number, and you can see 852,000. So you can see the revenue is down year over year, specifically on the Del Taco restaurant side. But you can, what I'd like to see here is how how much profit is driven by Jack in the Box, 85k, relatively fairly consistent year over year, uh, versus Del Taco, which is only 9.6 million, right? So 84.5, 9.6 million. So you can see in terms of importance for the business, for this investment to work at this specific time, uh, Jack in the Box is going to be the most important. So well, the investor deck that we're going to go into talks a lot about both of them. We're pretty much going to ignore um, Del Taco for now because even if I'm right on Del Taco, it's not going to be big enough to influence the overall business, at least at this juncture. I always like businesses on a 10K. I always like to see the properties. And you can see, in terms of store count, you can see very much, especially on the Jack in the Box side, very much franchised out, very heavy in Texas and very heavy in California, which is the two uh, largest populations in America. And on the uh, Del Taco side, again, biggest in California. And you'll notice one of the things that's also happening at the same time is that California continues to increase minimum wages. It's basically making the QSR, especially the franchisees, have to raise prices. And I think that's part of the reason why we're seeing such a shift um, as people, especially lower income consumers, are like, well, I can't afford that, so I'm just going to go to the grocery store or the Walmarts of the world. And so we could we keep seeing that as um, states raise minimum wages, and I think that's what's happening now. Um, they didn't actually call out California on the call, but we have seen price takes shoot up, which would validate that thought process. And you can see, again, Del Taco has more company-owned stores versus franchisees, whereas we favor franchisees uh, in the long run anyway. Right now, we, we'll see them get squeezed, I think. We're just going to put more pressure on this, which is what the stock market's trying to run, right? That's why all of them went down at once, right? That's why Wendy's went down, Del Taco went down, or Jack of the Box went down, McDonald's went down. They all go down kind of together because they're all feeling this crunch all at once and a loss in share for the industry. 
another way to show this is how easy it was for them to take price again a franchisee you want franchisor rather you want that price take because you ride on it you ride those royalties and we saw a strong same store sales and then all of a sudden you see the opposite end as inflation slows and you're still getting pinched up but here you can see very stark contrast year over year right in terms of same store sales so i thought it was just interesting point of view um now we'll go into the slide deck here um in terms of the business jack in the box is actually far superior to what it was probably six years ago or seven years ago despite the share price if you look at a chart you might think well it looks like it's just as bad or just as good um it, it is better in terms of the fundamentals of the business um though it does have some leverage again which we'll talk about which is one of the head points with uh wendy's is the balance sheet isn't uh pristine so here you can see they have improved the uh the uv growth and we have seen same store averages continue to grow the five percent clip year over year for the last few years in terms of the franchisee pressure, we've actually seen the EBITDA for a franchisee increase since 2019. So, so far during the inflationary period we had um, over the last four years, technically the franchisees are actually 40% better off in terms of EBITDA versus what they were in 2019, at least for Jack in the Box, which is interesting and which does invite that Jack in the Box wouldn't have to spend as much to promote or support its franchisees because franchises are actually better off versus 2019. Though that isn't to say that they might not be giving some of that back right now with uh, the pressures on minimum wage. So anyway, this is their footprint. And I, I'm really the sucker for maps. <laughs> you can see um, very underfinished on the East Coast. Del Taco, let's see in Florida, back in the box. Again, we already showed the footprint, but California and Texas are the big ones for these two. And there are some interesting things as we go through the side. I thought this was interesting on the deck. It's basically the new market openings have sustained higher weekly AUVs than our best performing restaurant. So we're just seeing superior, or the franchisees are superior, seeing superior sales numbers, even better than their best performing restaurants for when new stores open. And we've seen those lines and we've seen those headlines in the local communities when a new, um, there it is, could be Jack in the Box or it could be another QSR that doesn't exist in that area before. And people are aware of it because they've seen it in other states so they get all excited. And that trend has continued for whatever reason. <laughs> People get very excited and line up for it. And that new, uh, new QSR around the block that they've been waiting to go for the state for. it. Um, we'll go to the balance sheet again when we go through the financials. But it does show up here. It is a large amount for them. So it is five times right now through 2024. Um, which is higher than I like. So this will never be a best idea because of the debt. It is pushed out a little bit. 26. Right. So and then you have a decent amount pushed out to 29. So you do have some refinancing risk here. I mean, they were never getting good rates to begin with, 4.2%. <laughs> um, but yeah, 30% are staggered after 2029, assuming you include that. So again, not a great balance sheet in terms of the overall business, but in terms of maturity schedule and rollover risk and refinancing risk, it's still pushed out pretty well. So there's nothing crazy there, especially as rates slowly come back down. But again, the biggest uncertainty for me would be 2027, uh, because I do think rates would be lower especially by this point but you never actually know that and it's not like they're getting good rate anyway so there's not like a huge spread <laughs> in terms of cash flow the company's actually very well relatively profitable and they've been paying but but they made the decision to buy back a lot of themselves over the last since during the covid area and you've seen that in share purchases so they've made a decision to buy back a lot of themselves which is helping to boost the eps but at the same time we saw the balance sheet so really they've taken they've allowed themselves to take on debt instead of paying it down two buyback shares to juice the EPS number, whereas I'd rather that they pay down debt, <laughs> right? And now we're at the share price that this would be really nice if they could buy back the business at the current share price. Right? And we've seen that a few times that companies buy back more of the business when they're able to, when it's usually when the share price is doing very well because the cash flow is doing very well. And now at times where um, franchisees might be under pressure, they no longer have that capability to buy back shares meaningfully. Um, so anyway. <laughs> payback period i always like to look at that different franchisees uh different break payback periods you can see five years here for jack and del taco so not amazing not horrible you can see um it cost basically just think of it if you were to be a franchisee you would need two million dollars to build this thing out and it pays back basically 400k a year so it takes five years to get that back that's kind of the rough if you're to napkin math it they do talk up a decent game for the most investment management teams will on their deck and why you should invest in them. They do talk about a decent game. They have a lot of things here. 
it would have been nice. I like the master decks that are a little bit cleaner, so they'll have like just what I'm gonna do here, 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 here. This has a lot of things. <laughs> they don't have a list of the things. So we're gonna talk into a lot of them all at once. But there's a couple of things here. They're gonna improve the restaurants or operations, and they're also gonna improve marketing technology. Okay, so those are the two we're gonna focus on. There's also other stuff here, but a lot of it's buzzwordy. Um, and they actually do have action plans there, just that they don't have it organized into action plans. So marketing marketing is actually very strong at Jack's. So I've never eaten there in my life, um, but I've heard of them quite a lot. They've actually seen them. I'm like I know the Jack of the Box is without actually going there, which would invite them. It's a pretty strong brand image for what it is, especially for only a billion dollar QSR. So you can see here, like you got Ryan Reynolds and Snoop Dogg. They've had some fun commercials over the years. According to them, they're the second most engaged QSR in TikTok, which is important because we've seen how TikTok can go crazy. Like we saw Abercrombie and Finch just shoot up because of this influence on TikTok, right? Influencers just drive things. And especially on TikTok, the group think on kids is huge. Like they all will follow whatever they're told. It, it's kind of scary. What else is there? So remodeling, remodeling helps quite a bit. So here's another stat, 16% same store sales lift over for growth on their models over the past few years. So this is huge, 60% um, sales lift. So the more stores that are revamped, the better it is. And you can see how much cleaner it looks. I, I do like how this store looks. So but that's just my opinion. <laughs> Here, so innovation. So really that's just trying to get new things. And all the QSRs try this. They'll try new things and they'll fail or they'll learn and come back and try again. So you have red foot bull infusions here, right? Boba drinks, stuff like that. They'll try to introduce new things into the menu. Um, value. So this is going to be important when we go to the call. I'm trying to go a little bit quick here because I have so many slides. But value is going to be a big driver this year. It's probably the back half of 24 into 25 even. Um, just how much pressure we're seeing so that the more they can uh, push the value and still make decent money uh, it's going to be critical for the next bit here as people trade down and then they do think that they're able to find some um, cost savings through either menu simplification drink standardization so i would view that as um, basically reducing the skew count <laughs> so focusing on certain things allows the franchisees to scale better We've seen renovation or innovation here on the cheese pump and hydro rinse so when these things are all underway. So there, there are things here that they can do. This is always important. So is the business operating at a higher level than it was in the past? The answer is yes. And I, I hate waiting for fast food. <laughs> so when something's 10% better than it was uh, two years ago, that's a benefit in my eyes. Um, again, this is just a speed per same store sales growth. You can see that growing year over year. So I, I did find, again, I like the metrics, right? A five second improvement in speed translates to 8k sales uplift that's pretty crazy when you think about it eh? five seconds for a franchise and i just don't think of like an individual franchisee right 8k sales uplift for being five seconds faster it is interesting they're also trying to put kiosks in here um and we've seen that at mcdonald's already we're trying to put a new app new pos system so there are things here it's just hard to quantify them for investment purposes the balance sheet we already talked about the biggest weakness it sticks out like a sore thumb when you go through it you see a lot of the assets already depreciated there's not a lot here 20 million in cash right 420 million in ppe a whole lot of uh, ready use assets which is just uh putting the operating leases on the balance sheet you can see that here but the um the main thing here is the debt 1.7 uh, yeah 1.7 billion which is not small like i said five times um even a uh, the company, you know, however, is very profitable. You can see that in retained earnings. So it's been profitable over the years. Um, and what they've done with the cash largely is buy back shares. So you can see they bought back $3 billion of themselves. Um, so they've made an active decision to leverage up the balance sheet and buy back themselves. That's how I view the balance sheet if I had to snapshot it. Here you can see in terms of the share price, you see it's way down, right? Um, we'll go to the chart in a second. But you can see the EPS actually held in okay. Um, hasn't been great, but it hasn't been like it's dropped off horribly. We have seen revenue shoot down, but we've also seen the costs come down, and we've seen the earnings from operations come down, so that would invite more weakness. But honestly, it hasn't been as horrible as the share price has reacted to it. So basically, the share price is expecting more and more weakness to come. Or at least that's what I'd argue with articulating. On the cash flow, the main item here, there's a huge working capital noise here on accrued liabilities. So what you do here is basically well, what I would do. 
this is 113 and compare it to 95. So again, about 20% worse year over year in terms of CFO, in my opinion. And then you have a CapEx spend. So they're spending more to support the businesses and support the whole chain. And they did pay down debt um, slightly year over year, which did help to like a lowered interest expense. You can see they're largely um, using the cash on hand to buy back shares, even as the business has slowed. So they continue to make an active decision to buy back meaningful amounts of themselves. EPS, so what I like to do is how's this trend doing? Because when I look at the, um, here, if I look at the stock of Jack, you can see it's gone from 120 to 56, right? It's back around where it bottomed in 22, and it's not quite at the level of the world when COVID shut down. But you can see in terms of its long-term average, it's back down to 2014 levels, which is nice. So when I when I like to look at it, I'm like, okay, so how's the business actually performing? So if I go back to 2018, right, when the share price was, let's call it in this area, between 100 to 80, the business wasn't amazing, right? We're talking 420 earnings power, 360, 380, right? So not nothing crazy pre-COVID, just things like four bucks-ish, and then um, doing nothing really. But it, somehow the share price was <laughs> between 100 and 80, so 20 to 25 times earnings with a decent growth, I guess, on the top line, but not that much growth. And then you had um, the latest periods where your earnings per share shoots up to 740, 540, and 640. So way better than the $4 it was averaging. But now the share price is back down to uh, way before this area where the numbers were even as half as good as they are now. So I'm getting, relative to his long-term average, I'm getting opportunity jack in the box. That's really the long-winded way of saying what I'm saying. Um, now we'll talk, one of the exciting things, why I want to do the video this week, is because Lamb Weston missed. And Lamb Weston gets like, I think it's like 80% of its um, sales are from QSRs for fries. And so we've seen a huge pullback in <laughs> demand for fries. Now there's other things going on with Lamb Weston specific to them. But I thought that was very interesting. And here they flag Lamb Weston flags. Uh, one quarter of the volume decline was due to soft rest restaurant trends in North America. And other key international markets and then they also had their own voluntary product decline so you look at the share price it's not all because of qsr all of a sudden came down they also had a recall here as well this company also looks interesting i might do a video on it at some point this is just lamb weston talking about the restaurant industry because i like to see how the suppliers do it because this company supplies the fries to the qsrs right but you can see again that during the fourth quarter u.s restaurant traffic qsr is down about three percent versus the prior year traffic qsr's chain especially in hamburgers and you have to remember the qsr's got cut in half or most of them have, <laughs> not all of them, but quite a few of them have, and so you're seeing what a three percent slowdown or decline, so year over year, not just slowdown, um, is having on the share price, which is which is fun to look back on. Like, look at those couple of years, and like remember that time. But anyway, I just thought that was interesting. You can see hamburger especially was weak, with May down six percent. So what I'm less than saying, well now they're promoting more, which should help drive volume from their point of view. But from our point of view, that metric margins are still on the franchisee side. And then this was the fun metric here. I thought this was fun. Particularly the QSRs, which is 80% of French fry consumption. I just never knew that. So I, I was like, is it really 80%? And yeah. So <laughs> now you know. 80% of French fry consumption is in the quick service restaurant channels, the fast food places, which is, which is uh, startling when you think about it. Um, in terms of the call itself for Jack in the Box, they talk about the lower income gas being the most challenge. They want to the strategies combine or provide the compelling value. So again, it's referencing what we kind of already knew that the, the middle or sorry, the low income consumers is not showing up. Um, they have done some things. So this is the product innovation of Smash Jacks doing good. So it proved average check at 200 bips, so 2%. Uh, resonate with the premium guests again not referencing the lower income guests so i thought that was interesting here's another fun one the flagging the macro headwinds blah 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 and in this tree we're seeing this kind of pressure from that consumer we're going to talk about for the rest of the year we know what the competition is doing and then they have their munchies and their four dollar price point we have things that are five dollar price points again so they're they're competing here on price so you should see more deals on the qsr into Q3 and Q4, which does mean it probably had time on this idea. I thought this stat was interesting just because I was like, well, what does all the like putting on a kiosk into a store or a franchisee do for that franchisee? 
I didn't think that was interesting. Kios, Adele, and Jack were seeing about a 15 to 20% lift in ticket, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. For people buy more when they don't have to order uh, to a person. And then they also save labor. So about four to six weeks an hour in labor. And you can, I mean, you, McDonald's did it for a reason, right? <laughs> um, so you're expecting to see that as well. And then I thought this was just interesting from our color. They saw pressure on Dreftis as well as attachment rates on drinks and combos were lower so people weren't buying the full combo they were just buying what they wanted um, again that would in invite that people are still pulling back yeah it's just an interesting time to look at industry that's under pressure kind of what i look for and then i try to take little shots as usually at some point the stock market will overreact and whether that's now or next quarter it's always the toughest thing to say but uh anyway I'd like to know your thoughts on the qsr thing there's a whole lot of we're in the middle of earnings season so anyway have a have a great rest of your week <laughs>